by luck i became a student of swami's college but it is very important now to become a student of swami swami has a million ways of drawing us somebody has come as a teacher somebody has come as a doctor somebody has come as a technician engineer but then the challenge that he throws to each one of us is what are you going to now do about this i offer my most loving pranams at bhagwan's lotus feet i pray to swami that he gives all of us the understanding that it is swami who speaks it is swami who listens through each one of us respected elders sisters and brothers sairam to all of you at the very outset i would like to thank the samarpan team offer my gratitude to each one of them not because they've invited me of course i'm grateful for that i would like to offer my gratitude as a listener swami entered my heart through the process of listening and i continue to try to preserve him there through the process of listening and programs such as these are the greatest treasure that is available in the world today whether we acknowledge it or not brother sadat very kindly introduced me and he said i come from a family of devotees what he didn't mention was the family was devotees not me <laughs> so when i first came or when i was supposed to come and join swami's university while a lot of people must have been preparing to clear the exam i was sincerely preparing to not clear the exam trying as hard as possible to ensure that i don't clear that entrance and i did well in that preparation because i had absolutely no inclination to become a student of swami i remember telling my parents i cannot imagine a college life wearing whites and doing bhajans swami must have smirked to himself but here i am all that my mother said was it's all right if you don't want to study in swami's college it's all right if you don't want to become a student there just go and step foot on prashant nilayam and come that is enough that was what that was all she said just go and step foot there and come and i sincerely said that's all i'm going to do so to give you an idea of how well prepared i was for the exam the first time i touched those books to prepare for the entrance exam was on the night i was packing to come for the exam so i packed the books sincerely came to prashant nilayam the night before i felt a little guilty at least something we should read and i pick up the books and i realize i have a chemistry book and a physics book but i don't have a physics exam at all so that's how sincerely i prepared for the entrance exam came wrote the exam swami had other plans thankfully so i'm i can't be grateful enough that he chose not to answer my prayers i cleared the entrance and just to go through the things the first day in brindavan i land up in brindavan first darshan absolutely nothing happened right no outburst of emotions and no sudden uh, miraculous visions so i must have given the script of my life to some boring director to write he was used to writing slow movie screen plays i suppose so nothing happened swami came for darshan swami went so like it typically happens when you join a hostel i was extremely homesick and i thought to myself 
that next morning when my parents leave, I will leave with them. I can't stay in this hostel. So that was the plan. I said, next morning when my parents are leaving back to Chennai, I'll tell them, take me back with you. One night goes by, I wake up the next morning and I tell myself, I think I can manage one semester. Right? I thought I'll manage one semester, I'll go home for winter vacation and never return. One more night goes by and I tell myself, I think I can brave one degree. I think BSc I can manage and never coming back. And in the next few days, as I said, nothing extraordinary happened. No experience. Swami didn't speak to me. Swami didn't give me any experience in that sense as we understand it. But merely listening to about Swami from my friends, classmates and teachers who for no reason, it was not, it was not to win you over to this side, it was not to convince you about anything, but they were just sharing their love for Swami. And in those next few days, I don't know what happened. A couple of weeks later, Swami chose to give a taste to all of us about how uncertain Swami is, to love His uncertainty. We all invited Swami to the college campus. Sometimes it would happen that Swami would start the semester by giving the first discourse on the, during the moral class. So that used to be a tradition, but slowly the tradition uh, faded away. But once in a while, Swami would do that. So we all prayed to Swami during one of the three sessions that Swami should come to the university. Swami said, yes, I will come. And Swami gave us a date. Swami said, 17th of June. So that weekend we went to the hostel, we scrubbed the corridors, we cleaned all the cobwebs, cleaned it up as well as we could. Swami said, 17th of June. 16th of June, Swami leaves for Prashantinilya. And he kept his word because on 17th of June, Swami went to the college in Prashanti <laughs> And that's when we realized that Swami's words are deeper than we could ever comprehend. Talking about Swami's uncertainty, and every time I say, I speak about Swami's uncertainty, I remember this episode. Because even as we prepare to love Swami's uncertainty, I think it is important to keep this in mind. There was a student who once spoke in Swami's presence and he chose to speak on this theme, loving Swami's uncertainty. It's a Swami's quotation, isn't it? So he spoke about it. At the end of it, Swami called him and Swami said, what did you speak? Swami wants to show that he is disappointed, the pichi pichi ka matla now, all silly, stupid things you speak. Swami said, what did you speak? He said, Swami, your quotation, love my uncertainty. And Swami said, who said I am uncertain? Who told you that I am uncertain? And then Swami made a very beautiful and profound relationship. In this world, only Swami is certain. Everything else is uncertain. <laughs> Swami said, everything else, people may like you, may not like you, may celebrate you, may not celebrate you, may reward you, may not reward you. You may become successful, you may not become successful. But if there is one thing that is certain in this life that we all have been blessed with, it is Him, isn't it? His love. So even as we say that we should love Swami's uncertainty, let us also keep in mind that there is nobody more certain than He is. So as I said, 16th of June, suddenly Swami decided to surprise all of us. Till three days ago, we didn't know that Swami was leaving. All of a sudden, Swami leaves. And when Swami left, remember I said, 
I will last one day, I will last one semester, I will last one year. And when Swami left, one realizes that some part of you has left with him. And that is when it occurred that this life cannot be spent without him. We have a lot of plans, right? As Brother Siddharth said, that Swami had planned that I should come and speak here today. I am sorry to disappoint you, it was not for you, it was for me. Because I feel every time Swami gives me an opportunity to speak, it is probably I who need that rumination on Swami more than anybody else. And I most honestly believe it. So if there was some other speaker who was supposed to come and Swami chose me, it was because Swami said, you need it. And that's why he has sent me here. And I am very, very grateful for that. As we go through life, we, we take ourselves too seriously, right? As I said, I thought I'm going to not clear this exam. I have decided how I'm going to live my life. I have decided how my future should be. But it is his grace and his love that he chooses to give whatever he gives us. There was another old student whom we were talking to who narrated a very similar first few days. His parents were very devoted to Swami and they were very keen that he should become a student. He wasn't very keen. So pretty much like me, he came, he said, I should do whatever it takes to not clear this exam. So he had to write three subjects. He had to write English, Maths and Science. So he said to do badly in English is below my dignity. So I'll do well in English. This came from a good school. He said English I'll do well, Maths and Science I will not study. In fact, a couple of times he would be sitting in Darshan line and Swami would come and ask him, studying Maths and Science? And he would say, yes, Swami, he would have a maths or science book with him with a comic book under it. <laughs> Imagine a traditional way of hoodwinking our parents, this boy was trying with Swami. So every now and then Swami would come and ask him, are you studying? He said, yes, Swami, and show the book. The exam day comes. Morning there was supposed to be the English exam, lunch break, and then the science and maths exam. The boy writes the English exam and goes and has a hearty lunch, comes back and he finds all the exam halls locked and all the students are standing outside wondering what happened, why is the hall not yet open? There's a lot of chaos, everybody is trying to figure out what is happening and suddenly the vice principal comes running, panting and puffing. And he comes and he looks at all of them and says, boys, boys, is an important announcement. Swami has told, this year for 11th standard entrance, only English exam, no maths and science. <laughs> so there went all his plans of not doing well in the entrance. So clearly he had done very well in the English exam. The next day Swami calls the family for an interview. And the first thing Swami looks at him with a twinkle in his eye, Yentra, how was your maths and science exam? <laughs> Oftentimes, you know, when you talk about entrance exams and it's the season of the exams, I guess I'm speaking a lot of exams, we think there is a cutoff mark, there is a filtering process. But the concept of filtering doesn't somehow fit in with Swami, isn't it? He's not here to filter us out. He's here to try as much as possible to create opportunities for us to come to Him, move closer to Him. One of my classmates, when we were once sharing these ideas, I mean sharing these experiences of how each one came to become a student of Swami in our class, so a couple of students had their own stories. So one of my classmates, he said that in the uh, 
college, how it happens is we all join the college on June 1st after writing the entrance and the attending the interviews. But invariably the 12th results would come much later, sometime in end of June or July. So what we are given is called a provisional admission. Right? So based on whether you clear your 12th exams or not, you are retained in the college or you are asked to leave. So there was this student, he had clearly not done well in his 12th exams, but he had got admission in Swami's college. So he was counting his days. So the res exam results are coming 10 days later. So I can be a student of Swami for 10 days. So he says, in the 10 days, I should get as much as I can. So he goes and one day sits right in front and tries all kinds of things. So one day Swami comes and speaks to him. Swami asks him, what is your name? <coughs> he tells his name. His name was Arun Shastri. Then Swami asks him, where are you from? He says, Swami, I'm from Kochi. Swami says, ah, Kochi Shastri. And this boy is delighted because that is how Swami had called his grandfather when he came for the first time. <laughs> Swami would look at him and say, ah, Kochi Shastri has come. So this boy was delighted. He said, okay, 10 days is enough. I've got all that I want. Right? So then the exam results come. And to his surprise, he clears the exam. He has not failed in any exam. But he realizes he has got an aggregate of 57% or something. And the cutoff was 60%. So he thinks that either I would have failed in an exam or I wouldn't have crossed the cutoff. So the results come, the warden calls him to the office and gives him the mark sheet. So this boy sincerely asks the warden, Sir, so when should I pack my bags? The warden asks him, are you planning to go somewhere? He said, Sir, I think I won't have my admission anymore. So the warden tells him, why, what is wrong? You have cleared, look at your marks. So he says, he sees and he's delighted he has cleared. But then he says 57%. But he says, sir, the cutoff is 60 percent, isn't it? Mine says 57 percent. The warden tells him, yes, that is the case. But for some reason, this morning, Swami all of a sudden called me and said, for this year, cutoff is 55 percent. <laughs> Maybe just to answer the prayer of that one student, Chancellor of the university, can't argue, right? It's another classmate of mine who is narrating his experience. This boy had failed, right? He didn't escape like the other student. The marks come and he sees that he has failed in mathematics. So with a very, very heavy heart, he prays to Swami and goes to sleep. He says, Swami, you've brought me so far, you've got me so close, will you send me away? He said, somehow do something, please keep me at your feet. He says, the next morning he wakes up, the mark sheet says, failed in mathematics, but in the end the mark sheet says, pass. So he says, I still have that mark sheet which says, failed in mathematics, but passed in 12th exams. There is one thing that I would often tell Swami and pretty much I am going to talk about that. Clearly from what I told you about my first few days, I didn't come to Swami's college for Swami. I came to the college for education. So I would tell Swami in my prayers, in my letters, I used to tell him, Swami, I came here for education, but I am here now for you. I might have come for education, but I will be here for you. Because in this journey, you could have a little bit of luck in coming to know of Swami. By luck, I became a student of Swami's college. But to become a student of Swami is not by chance. It's only by effort. There is a beautiful word in Sanskrit, 
for luck, which is used in a lot of our Indian languages too. The word is adrishtam, right? You must have heard that. Adrishtam means luck. But the word actually has a very interesting meaning. Adrishtam means unseen. Adrishta. Which means, I don't know how this luck has come to me, but there must be some logical reasoning for it. Right? How did I come to Bombay? I can tell you I got into a car, I came to the airport, I took a flight. I know the sequence of events that has led to where I am at this moment. But when you say something is luck or fortune or chance, it is adrishta, which means there is a sequence of events which has brought this to me, but I don't know what is that sequence of events. Which means even what we refer to as chance or luck is something that we have worked for in some unseen, unknown time. That gives us a little bit of opportunity to grab this and say, I have worked for this, isn't it? Ah, I have got this. I have, I have earned it. We were once speaking to one old student who narrated this very interesting sequence of events. Swami had taken them to Kodekanal and whether or not the students are excited, Swami would be very excited about the picnics. Right? He has seen Kodekanal any number of times, physically. He is the one who has created it, for God's sake. But the idea of taking students to a picnic spot and showing them scenic beauty would excite Swami. And Swami will say, ah, we'll, go. we'll go to the lake, we'll go to this, we'll go to that. So that day, Swami was very excited about taking the students to the Silver Cascade waterfalls. So, Swami in his typical style would have marketed the whole thing. Oh, it's a very beautiful place. Oh, the waterfall will come like that and you can see it from far and all that. Because otherwise the students would be happy sitting there <laughs> around Swami. So, Swami has to market the idea of going out. So, Swami says, Cascade Falls, Silver Cascade. So, the boys file into the bus. Swami gets into a car and leads the procession. At one particular point in the journey, Swami stops the car and gets into the bus. So all the students are really excited. Swami takes one of the seats in the bus and you can just imagine or picture that scene. One head on Swami's left shoulder, one head on Swami's right shoulder, two heads on Swami's lap and absolutely no space left. Swami is covered with faces and heads and people holding him and Swami gives himself to that. So Swami is talking to them, telling them stories, everybody is excited. Finally, the bus reaches the spot and Swami says, ah, it has come, Silver Cascade. And it's a beautiful place, isn't it? It's a very beautiful waterfall. The moment they reach there, imagine the switch in the scene. All of these students now peering out of the window and looking at the beautiful waterfall. Swami is sitting there, he was the center of all attention. Next moment, everybody is looking out of the window, looking at the waterfall. And suddenly Swami's face becomes small. And in a very sad voice, Swami says, keep looking, keep looking, beauty is outside. After all, only God is inside. <laughs> So sweetly and so, so profound, right? It's not a scene only for that bus. It is a dialogue for each one of our lives. Keep looking, keep looking. All beauty is outside. After all, only God is inside. Who's interested in looking inside? After all, it's only God inside. So Swami says this, beauty is outside, only God is inside. And the next moment, all these curtains are drawn. <laughs> And all boys turn towards Swami. But they have upset the child in Swami. <laughs> Swami has become a little upset. Swami is not talking. Swami is not smiling. 
they were all excited about taking pictures with Swami and all that, but now Swami is like going through the motions. Then the trip is over, they come back to Sai Shruti. Still Swami is upset. Still Swami is not talking normally. Everybody is wondering what happened now. <clears throat> so Swami is sitting, students sitting around. So somebody thought that we should begin the conversation. So one of the students says, Swami, we are so fortunate to be with you. Swami says, hmm. <laughs> then somebody adds, one of the devotees there adds, Swami, we don't think we have done anything in this life to deserve this opportunity. We must have done something in some Purva Janma, some past life. Because they, we have done nothing to deserve this. Swami is quiet. <laughs> Then somebody else adds, Swami, we have not done, we might have done in some past birth, not only us, our seven generations would have done all the good and that is why we are here. And Swami nodded. <laughs> so then they said, it's better to keep quiet now. Then Swami started speaking. Swami said, do you know these great yogis and tapasvis, who do meditation in the Himalayas. They all nodded. We all have seen in Amar Chitra Katha, in our movies and serials. And Swami said, you know, these people, they do tapas for hundreds of years. And when I go and grant them a vision, Swami says, when I go and grant them a vision, it is for a few minutes. Swami said, look at all of you how many hours you get to spend in Swami's presence. And then Swami said, some of you at least are here, but even others, Swami said, you feel like seeing Swami, get into a bus, get into a flight, get into a train, huh? you come and see Swami. All these years when this was available to us, how much did we cherish it? that we could take a train and go and see God. That we could hop into a bus and next morning we could have the darshan of God himself. He gave it to us for decades and decades together. Swami said, do you realize how fortunate you all are? And then Swami explained, Swami said, not one of you in front of me is worth one moment in front of me. He said, not one of you in front of me has done enough merit to deserve one moment in front of me. And Swami says, you know it. But then you don't want to let go of that pride. So you say, Swami, I have not done anything, maybe in some past life, which means you are trying to hold on to it through Adrishta. I have not done anything, but I only done in some other body, in some other life. And some of you say, no Swami, my ancestors would have done. Swami says, neither you, nor your ancestors, neither in this life, nor in any lifetime, have you done anything worthwhile to get one moment in front of me. Swami said, yes, you have done good. And your goodness has been attracted to my godliness. But that does not mean you deserve what you get from me. It is only my grace. And then Swami said, but that is not the saddest part. The saddest part is, not one of you in front of me use one millionth of this opportunity that I am giving you. That is the saddest part. Though I am trying to speak about this journey from being a student of Swami's college to being a student of Swami, this is not something that is exclusive for those who have enrolled in Swami's schools and colleges. Some way we all have come to Swami. Some of us have come through Balvekas, some of us have come through Seva. 
I have met a lot of people who have come as taxi drivers bringing devotees to Parthi and they've become devotees themselves. Some have come as flower vendors. There are people in Bangalore, they found that suddenly flower sales seem to be going up every few days in a month. Then they realized that Swami was staying in a house nearby. They go and have Swami's darshan, darshan and become Swami's devotees. Swami has a million ways of drawing us. Somebody has come as a teacher, somebody has come as a doctor, somebody has come as a technician, engineer. But for whatever reason, Swami has given us that good fortune. Swami has given us that first contact. But then the challenge that He throws to each one of us is, what are you going to now do about this? I remember reading a survey that was done, I think, in the US. Very interesting survey. They wanted to go and find out what happens to all of these people who win lotteries and jackpots and Super Bowl, uh, you know, those big prize monies that you win. Who wants to be a millionaire, Khan Baringa, Karurpati, all of those kind of things. Suddenly you get a huge amount of fortune, right? One million, ten million, hundred million. What happens to these people who win these bounties? So they go and do a survey of a few hundred people who have won such lotteries and uh, money prizes. And they come up with this very scary result which says 70% of such people who are lucky to win such prize money fritter away all of their fortune in the first one year. Imagine the first one year they fritter away whatever they won and they've gone back to what they were before they won. And the survey suggests that this is probably a problem if you are given something that you have not consciously worked for. Something comes to you as a stroke of luck. Perhaps our minds are not wired enough to grab that opportunity and make it last. You can fritter away a hundred million dollars. Can I choose to fritter away this opportunity which is one in a million lifetimes? Shouldn't it make us lose our sleep? Swami, you have given us something like this. Shouldn't that statement that Swami made, not one of you is making use of one millionth of what you've got from me. Shouldn't it wake us up in the middle of the night and ask, make us ask, Swami, what do you want me to do? What should I do? What should I do? So by some stroke of luck, we all have come in contact with Swami. But it is very important now to become a student of Swami. Swami tells that the relationship between Arjuna and Krishna was one of friendship. They were brother-in-laws in a way. And they were always together, Swami said, they would eat together, they would sleep together, they would go around and you know, they would do a lot of things together, very, very friendly, inseparable. But Krishna never gave the Gita to Arjuna. Till the point in the battlefield when Arjuna looked at Krishna and said, he said two things. He says, Sishas Teham, accept me as your disciple, accept me as your student. Tvam Prapannam, I surrender to you. Decades of contact with the Jagat Guru, you could have the, the fountainhead of supreme wisdom beside you, but you will be left thirsty if you have not asked for it. So in the final years of his life, Arjuna looks at Krishna and says, Sishyas Teham, accept me as your student. Arjuna, Krishna says, fine, 
now I'll become your guru, now I'll become your teacher. So in this journey, it is important for all of us not merely to worship him, adore him, keep a picture of his in our wallet, on our phones, in our houses. This is not to belittle any worshipful attitude or worshipful actions towards Swami, but that is not sufficient. At some point, we must look at Swami and say, Swami, I want to be a Sai student. I want to be Swami's student. And for that, I believe age is no bar, gender is no bar, education is no bar. If Swami can make a 60% cutoff to a 55% cutoff, what cannot Swami change for you and me if we are willing to be His students? Why is it important to have this relationship of a student with Swami? The, one of the most comforting thing for us is, as I said, we all, whenever I speak to youth, I make it a point to tell this to them. Especially in, in nowadays, when you meet a lot of youngsters, when you ask them, how did you come to know Swami, what will they say? Second generation devotee, third generation devotee, my grandparents came to Swami. I always tell them one thing, remember, Faith is never inherited. Faith is never inherited. It does not come to you from your father, from your grandfather. Faith is between you and Swami. If you have it, He has blessed you. If you are trying to preserve it and make it stronger, that is your relationship with Swami. Don't rest on the laurels that I come from a family that came to Swami in 60s, 50s. Or don't think that I didn't come from a devotee family, so I don't have a chance. Because faith is never inherited. And He knows us much, much, much more than any of us know ourselves. There was this very senior student of Swami we were talking to once. Again, going back to an admission story. So this student, he finished his 10th standard in... Hyderabad and his mother as all noble mothers are calls him and says enough you have studied in this city now you go and become a student in Swami's college <clears throat> gives him some money packs his bag puts him on a bus to Brindavan and says go become a student of Swami those were the days when the university was not there the arts and science college in Brindavan so he comes to Brindavan meets the lecturers and he's promptly told, there is no seat available, all the seats have been filled. So he gets into this bus, goes back home, goes home and the mother looks at him and asks, why have you come back? So he says, they told me there is no seat available. The mother tells him, nothing doing, go back, do whatever it takes, become a student, don't come back home. Even though faith is not inherited, I am sure each one of us have to be grateful to our parents for having given us the gift of faith. Right? All of us, for whom as part of the most important inheritance we have been introduced to Swami, I think we all should be grateful to our parents and our family. So this noble mother, she says, whether there is a seat in the college or not, there is no place in the house for you anymore. He says, go, become a student of Swami, do what it takes, stand upside down, stay on the road, what it takes, become a student of Swami. So the boy goes back, again goes to the authorities, they tell there is no seat. So he says, sir, I cannot go back, please, I have to become Swami student, I want to become Swami students, please do something. So they are trying to discourage him, they are trying to tell him that, you know, we don't have science, you can take commerce. He says, sir, anything, I want to be a student of Swami. So they realize that is not working. Then they tell him, there is no place in the hostel, you can become day scholar if you want. He says, okay, anything, I just want to be a student of Swami. <coughs> so then they tell him, if you want to be a day scholar, you should be from the city, but you are from Hyderabad. 
so he asks so what do you want me to do he says go find a local guardian so the boy just goes to one of the neighbors where he was staying and he says sir can you be my local guardian i want to become a student of swami and this person who is a devotee of swami he says why not if because of this you can be a student of swami i will come i will be your guardian so he comes signs as the guardian the boy joins as a day scholar but still his heart is not full he says swami but i am not in your hostel because hostel students are special day scholars are they come and go right so he starts praying and writing letters swami please take me in your hostel please take me in your hostel one hand prayer to swami on the other hand application to the principal and the warden sir please take me in the hostel please take me in the hostel three months he struggles he says in those three months he follows the schedule of the hostel more rigorously than the boys in the hostel because he says swami this is my commitment i want to show you that if you give me this opportunity i will be the best student i can be the teachers observe him for these three months they eventually call him and they tell him okay we'll make some space for you come and join the hostel the boy is delighted he says today i have become a student of swami right 100% student of swami so he joins the hostel and he feels a sense of achievement he said wow what a great achievement i have finally become a student of swami so that day when they all go for swami's darshan he is standing there and swami comes for darshan brindavan old brindavan boys never used to sit down they used to stand as swami would come for darshan swami comes up to him where he was standing and this boy kneels down and says swami give me path namaskar because i have been victorious he doesn't say that but in his mind he is thinking what a great achievement i have uh, done today i deserve a pad namaskar he says swami please give me pad namaskar swami looks at him and says enduku <laughs> says why birthday na swami asks is it your birthday he says no swami and swami says i'll give you on your birthday why simply i should give <laughs> and walks away so this boy is happy because he got into the hostel swami spoke to him but he is also sad because like many of those people in that era this boy didn't know his birthday right he comes from a family that they didn't note down the birthday properly so they just put something on the record for schools and all that and they get in so this boy thought to himself sami i don't know when is my birthday how will you give me pad namaskar on my birthday so anyway he joins the hostel goes on with the schedule the year gets over vacations come and the year was 1979 during summer course letter goes out to all the students saying that swami is calling all the students to report for summer course so this boy comes summer course is going on thousands of students on one particular day they are all seated in the auditorium waiting for the sessions to start swami comes for darshan and swami goes around giving one round of darshan again goes around then goes into some lanes in this one and that one in this row and that row it looked like swami was searching for someone so swami was going around like this and finally comes to this corner where this boy was sitting and the moment swami sees him swami says ah here you are swami says come and this boy doesn't know what happened he runs to swami and in that sweetest of gest- gesture we have seen swami doing swami lifts his robe and swami says hmm chesko <laughs> this boy doesn't know why suddenly this fortune is coming his way but why will you ask questions when something nice is coming your way we all ask questions why me only when something unpleasant comes right and swami is giving pad namaskar you won't ask why me so this boy dives and takes his pad namaskar and he says 20 years later when he went to some nadi astrologer who they take the uh, fingerprint and all that they tell him your birthday is 20th may that was exactly the day swami came and told him take pad namaskar <laughs> so the solace for all of us is 
however accidental our entry or Swami's entry into our life may appear, neither are we new to Him or He new to us. Often times when I am given this duty of speaking in front of an audience, especially when the audience has devotees whose relationship with Swami is older than my age, I often think, what am I going to speak about Swami to them? What do I know about Swami to go and tell a devotee of 50 years what Swami is? But then the Keno Upanishad has a beautiful statement. He says, the Keno Upanishad says, if you say, I know God, then you are lying. Because God is never knowable. If anybody says, I've been here for 20 years, 25 years, 50 years, 60 years, I know Swami, then you're lying. The Upanishad adds, if you say, I don't know God, still you're lying. Because who doesn't know one's own self? So I take solace in that, that nobody in the audience can claim to say, I know God. But after all, we are talking about a God that we all know. And this is not about me telling something or me conveying or informing something. This is just we sharing a love for Swami, isn't it? So this journey with Him is, is not something that started recently. It's eternal. So when we say that we have to commit ourselves as students of Swami, who knows how many lifetimes we have not done this commitment. You know, when you look at this relationship a student has between a teacher, typically a teacher, a school teacher or a college lecturer, they play multiple roles, of which teaching is one of them, right? Though the most important one, teaching is one of the roles they play. Apart from that, they are also people who set the question paper. They are also the people who mark the question answer sheet after that. And they also play the role of the invigilator. Now, if I come to Swami and I don't strike this relationship of a student and teacher, then I am relegating Swami to the role of the examiner. Because nobody else is going to examine our answer sheet. He's the one who's going to tell, you did well, you did badly, your pass, your fail. That is why oftentimes Swami would tell some statements which appear to be contrary to each other. On one hand, Swami will say, I am only a witness. Right? Your good, your bad comes to you. I am only a witness. On the other hand, Swami will tell, grace can change anything. The nuance in that is probably this. If we relegate him to the role of an examiner, Swami will say, I am only a witness. At the end of your life, if you come and give me your answer sheet, I will only tell you pass or fail. Right? Because that is the role you have given me. And this is one thing probably about Swami. As I said, Krishna was with Arjuna for 50 years, 60 years. But till Arjuna said, make me your disciple, he did not take up that role. Till you ask, it will not be given. Once when Swami was talking to my batch students, when we were graduating, it was the final session that we were having with Swami. We were all seated around Swami in the bhajan hall. And Swami said, if any of you ask, have any questions, you ask. So one of my classmates got up and asked Swami in Telugu. He said, Swami, we all know that moksha or liberation is the ultimate. Why doesn't Swami give it to everybody? Right? He says, moksha is the ultimate gift. Swami is the most compassionate. So why doesn't Swami give moksha to everyone indiscriminately? Right? It seems like a good question. 
Swami, I think, engaged him with some reply. <clears throat> the whole conversation was happening in Telugu. Suddenly, Swami turned to one of my other classmates, <clears throat> who was a boy from North, North India, North India or Northeast India. Swami suddenly looks at him and says, Hey boy, what do you want? And this boy gets up straight. Swami, I want one more life. <laughs> the exactly wrong thing to ask at that moment <laughs> or the right thing because Swami wanted to convey something very important. He gets up and he very sincerely says, Swami, I want one more life. Swami said, one more life? Why? And this boy said, Swami, I always wanted to serve my nation by serving in the army. Right? I wanted to become an army officer and serve my nation. This time I missed the opportunity, I've become Swami's student. So I want one more life where I will join the army and serve my nation. Swami said, very good, noble thoughts. Right? Swami answered him in, asked him the question in English or Hindi, answered him. Then Swami turns to this boy who asked that question about moksha and Swami tells him, Idera, going to the Kalpavriksha and asking for coffee powder. <laughs> And then Swami told him, see, what he asked was totally different from what you asked. You have no right to ask for him. You have no right to come and tell me that give moksha to everyone. Only if that individual comes and says, Swami, I have had enough, free me, give me freedom. Swami says, then I will say tadastu. So unless we ask, he will not play that role. Unless we seek, he will not give. So if we do not give him this role of a teacher, he is going to be like that witness examiner whose only way of rewarding you is to look at that answer sheet. Now what happens if he becomes the teacher? In the first letter that Swami wrote, not the first letter, the letter that Swami wrote to his brother, where he declared his avatarhood, Swami writes a very beautiful statement and something that, could, that should give us enormous courage and confidence. Swami says, whoever strays from the right path, he writes in Telugu, Chaipatti kapadute vratamu naku. Right? Whoever strays away from the good path and goes into the wrong ways, Swami says, I will protect them. How will I protect them? Chaipatti kapadute vratamunaku. I have taken a vow that I will hold their hand and take them to the destination. What a beautiful assurance that Swami has given us. I often contrasted with us giving directions in Prashanti Nilayam. Somebody will come and ask us, how do we go to the northern canteen? How do we go to the stores? Very difficult to show directions. We will say, go straight, take a left, take a right and ask somebody else. <laughs> right? Because that's the best instruction you can give. There is no way from one point you can tell. Just tell them, go straight, you'll see a board. Go straight, you'll see somebody else in whites wearing a scarf, ask them. But Swami doesn't say, I will show you the direction. Swami says, I will hold your hand and take you to your destination. Which means, even in the role of a teacher, he is not going to be like a lecturer who stands there and gives a discourse and that's the end of it. He is going to become the personal tutor. Right? He is going to become the personal tutor. And remember, this tutor is only going to set the question paper. And that has advantages, isn't it? That always has advantages. Because he knows what is important to be learned. Because otherwise, imagine our life is so limited. The lifespan that is given to us is so limited. And how many advisors we have in this world today? 
we call them by different names, right? Celebrities, social media influencers, friends, best friends, elders, uncle in the family, auntie in the family, with due respect to all of them. But this little time and energy we have, we scatter it away by listening to so many people, isn't it? But here is one teacher who says, I will teach you because I know what is coming in the exam. I know what is necessary to be learned. There are a lot of things you can just read through. There are a lot of experiences in life which you can just pass through. Don't give it importance. This too shall pass. But when something important comes, I will draw your attention to it. <clears throat> and he says, in all his love, I will also leak the question paper once in a while. Swami was giving darshan one time and there was this devotee of Swami whom every day Swami would go and speak to. This devotee would get so overwhelmed every time Swami would come to him that he could never speak anything to Swami. So sometimes it would happen that Swami will wait there for a few seconds so that he can gather himself and then say something to Swami. And every time after darshan, he would go back home and his wife will tell, he said, you had to ask this, you had to give this, you had to take permission for this, you didn't do anything. So he said, okay, tomorrow I will try. What to do? Every time Swami comes in front of me, I get tongue-tied. So the next day he decided, he made a list. These are the things I have to ask Swami. <clears throat> so he sat there and he said, today if Swami comes and speaks to me, I have to ask him. So Swami comes in front of him and Swami clearly says, what do you want? <laughs> right? Multiple times Swami has asked him already. He was too emotional to say anything. Now this time Swami comes, stands in front of him and says, what do you want? And the list is coming out to his mouth. Just about to voice it, Swami says, shh. Right? Like a hissing snake. He says, Swami's eyes becomes, become intense and Swami says, shh, don't ask. Swami told him, don't ask. And he says, already with great difficulty, the questions were coming. And he said, it just got swallowed inside one more time. And then Swami told him, I will teach you a very important thing today. He says, I will teach you a very important thing today. Swami told him, Whenever Swami comes and asks, what do you want? When Swami stands in front of you and says, what do you want? You may have a million things to ask. But look at Swami and say, Swami, I want you. And Swami gave a very beautiful explanation. Swami said, see, as you go through life, you might want many things. You may think that you need many things, but you never know whether it is good for you or not. But when I come and ask you, what do you want? And you say, Swami, I want you, which means you are asking me to choose for you. And how will I choose wrong? Being the mother that he is, how will he choose something that is not good for us? Or another way of looking at it is, when you say, Swami, I want only you, he will choose only those things that will take us to him, isn't it? In those things that we want to ask him if there is something that is going to distract us or take us away from this destination, Swami will say, Akkar ledu, you don't need that. So Swami told him, every time I come and ask you, what do you want? You should say, Swami, I want you. And Swami, like a good teacher, let's try now I'll ask you. <laughs> Swami said, Chepu, what do you want? He said, Swami, I want you. Correct. What do you want? Swami, I want you. Gurtu Petko. Remember this at all times. Physically, Swami may or may not come and ask us. But every time we stand in front of Swami's altar, isn't Swami asking that, what do you want? You have come to Dharmakshetra, you have come to Prashantanilayam, what do you want? Swami has already leaked the answer. The answer is, 
Swami, I want only you. Swami, I want only you. So that is the advantage of making him the teacher. The question paper and the answer key has been leaked. But of course, this, this is a, a mantra that Swami has given which has to be contemplated upon. Right? Otherwise, we would give the wrong answer in the wrong place or the right answer in the wrong place. Swami would oftentimes go to the primary school in Pashantanilyam and Swami would go and pull up some tiny tot there and ask, what is your name, where are you from, what did you eat? So they all have been trained. When Swami comes and asks, where are you from? The answer is, from thy lotus feet. Right? That was the answer. Where are you from? From thy lotus feet. So Swami would have a lot of fun. And Swami would come and pick up a student and Swami will ask, where are you from? Swami, from thy lotus feet. Hey, Hyderabad Swami. <laughs> but Swami would appreciate that, right? But that answer is correct. You are from my lotus feet. So one time Swami, and Swami likes to show off, in quotes, to the dignitaries who would come, isn't it? So there was one minister who was visiting. Swami told him, come, I'll show you my school. Takes him to one of the younger classes, picks up one boy, and Swami asks him, hey boy, where are you from? From thy lotus feet. Swami looks at the minister and says, you ask, boy, where are you from? From thy lotus feet. <laughs> so the answer is correct, <laughs> but to the wrong question, or the wrong questioner. So though the answer has been leaked, it is important to think about the answer. What does it mean when I say, I want Swami? And what does it take to say, I want Swami, when you have other things that you want? That mananam, that contemplation, Swami has asked each one of us to do. So he is the one setting the paper. He is going to teach us what is important. Now he is going to come as the invigilator also. Now this is the confusing role. Right? This is the most confusing role Swami plays. Because the, the teacher who has taught you day and night, who has left no stone unturned to teach you the subject, he is standing beside you when you are taking the test, but he can't help you. There will be times in life when we will go through the test and we will ask Swami, where are you? Swami will say, I am here, but I can't help you. It's illegal. This test, Bangaru, you have to take it on your own. But I am here, as always. Once when we were uh, speaking to one of our teachers, one of our maths lecturers, we asked him about this. He said, <clears throat> he has gone through a lot of his share of troubles, ups and downs. So we would say, sir, how do, you, how do you reconcile with this fact that we have Swami and still we have to go through all of this? And what do you think is Swami's role in this? So being a teacher, he gave this beautiful analogy. He says, imagine one of my students is writing the exam and I'm invigilating. And I go and over his shoulder, I see what he's writing. Right? He's writing something. I can't tell him if he's written the wrong answer. I can't tell him, write this, write that, or this is the, you know, you, the steps are wrong, or nothing like that. But if he has done something correct, right, some problem he has solved correctly, he says, as an invigilator, I will just pat him on his back and say, good. That is no violation. He says, imagine the confidence that student feels when he gets that pat. Right? When that pat comes without the invigilator interfering in your test. And he says, I am with you. And he pats your back and says, good, you've done well. That confidence will make you write the other answers rightly, isn't it? At one time, Swami was in the city of Chennai. 
And those were the days when Swami's convoy didn't have a motorcade and the traffic would not be stopped for Swami. So like everybody else, Swami was stuck in the traffic. Right? This was sometime in the 60s. Swami was caught in a traffic junction and in the traffic there was this very poor looking man who had got into the traffic and he started wiping the cars. Right? You find a lot of people doing that. They'll quickly come and clean the windshield and they'll ask for a few rupees. So this man with a lungi and a torn bunion looking very disheveled, he was coming and wiping cars. Swami was sitting in the car, Swami looked, looks at that man and Swami tells the devotee next to him, go and call that man. So this devotee gets off from the car in the traffic and calls out to this man. The moment somebody calls out to him, this man has a terrified look and he starts running. He starts running away from there. And when he runs away, now this is a command, Swami said, get him. So in the middle of the traffic, this poor man is running and this devotee who is supposed to be a very rich person is chasing that man <laughs> and finally catches hold of him and brings him to Swami's car. And very hesitantly, this poor man looks into the car and the moment he sees Swami, he bursts out into tears. He says, Swami, and he falls at Swami's feet and Swami pats him and blesses him and Swami says, don't worry, Bangaru, I know everything. Always remember Swami is with you. Swami is still taking care of you. Don't worry, Swami says. And blesses him, gives him vibhuti and sends him off. And then Swami resumes. So this devotee asks, Swami, who is that person? How did he know you and why did you call him? And then Swami says, he is a very old devotee. He was a very wealthy man now who has lost all his money. And now he is down to the road. Swami said, it is his karma he has to go through. It is a process that he has to go through. But I wanted to remind him that even now I am with him. I wanted to remind him that I am standing by his side. So the role of the teacher, not just a teacher, but a personal tutor, Chaipatti Kapadute Vratamunaku. And then, that of the person who sets the paper, he knows what he is going to test us on. And Swami will often tell us, I actually don't have to test you because I know where you will fail. Then he becomes the invigilator. Then finally, he becomes the one who gives us the grades. There was this student of Swami in Swami's Brindavan College, old Brindavan. His father was a very great devotee, so makes him a student in Swami's college and gives him a simple piece of information, instruction. Swami tells him, uh, his father tells him, I don't care about your marks. I don't care whether you pass, you fail. Make Swami the center of your life. Please, Swami, that is all I will tell you. I will not pull you up if you do badly in your studies. But if there is any issue with discipline with Swami, then I will disown you. To that effect, he says. So the son takes his father's advice a little too seriously, becomes a very, very good student, if you know what I mean. So the father gives this instruction, but the mother is always worried. So whenever the mother comes for darshan, she would say, Swami, this boy is not studying. Swami, please do something. Swami, this boy is not studying. Do something. So every time Swami will come and tell, your mother is asking me, at least for that you study, I am answerable to her. So this boy would say, Swami, you know me, this is all I am capable of. One time Swami goes to his mother, she is standing in the darshan line, and exactly Swami goes to her and Swami says, did your boy tell you? Did your son tell you? He says, Swami, what? He got second rank. And the mother is delighted because this boy has never crossed second rank from the bottom. He got second rank and Swami is saying, Chepaleda. Hey, he got second rank. So the mother was very happy. She was waiting for the darshan to get over. And Swami finishes darshan, lady's side, comes to Jen's side, comes to the student side, comes to this boy. I saved your face with your mother, at least next time study. <laughs> 
This boy doesn't understand what has happened. So after Darshan, mother comes to him and Swami, mother says, what, you got second rank, you never told me? So the boy says, yeah, something like that only. <laughs> because in a class of three, one failed and two passed and he was the second person. <laughs> The first ranker got 80%. He just passed with 47% or something. <laughs> and the third fellow failed. So technically correct, second rank in the class. <laughs> so that was his academic uh, acumen. One time Swami comes and calls all the students and Swami tells, this time university exam, that time Karnataka University, right? Bangalore University. Swami says, this time, whoever gets first class, I will take them to OT. Right? This is the reward. As I said, teacher, tutor, invigilator, paper setter, and now the one who gives the reward. He says, if you get first rank or first class in your university exams, I will take you to OT. The moment this offer is made, this boy decides, okay, this time I'm going home <laughs> because I am never going to get first class and I'm never going to go to Uti, I can go home, spend my vacation at home. So every few days, Swami will keep reminding this, first class, Uti, first class, Uti. Finally, the results come. <coughs> A few boys, about 15, 20 of them get first class. This boy doesn't get first class as expected. So the day comes when Swami is packing to leave for Uti. Everything is ready, the cars are ready and all the boys have packed and they've come to the mandir ready to board the car. So this boy was also in the mandir but this time he was just helping them arrange things because he was not going anywhere. And as he was helping and putting away things and packing, a fleeting thought in his mind, maybe I should have also tried. Right? He's just thinking, maybe I should have also tried. And the thought passes his mind and somebody pats him on the back. He turns back and who was there? No, not Swami. It was the registrar of the college or it was one of the lecturers. And this lecturer looks at him and says, what are you doing here? Where is your bag? And this boy says, no sir, I, am not, I didn't get first class and I am not going to Uti. And the lecturer tells him, didn't anybody tell you? Your name is there in the list. Go quickly pack your bag and come. <clears throat> so this boy, he says, next 15 minutes, I didn't know what happened. I ran to the hostel, piled up my clothes in a bag and came running. And by the time he came, the, everybody had boarded the convoy and ready to leave. So he hops into one of the cars and all the other students are giving him looks now. How did this guy make it? <laughs> So Swami had made a very interesting arrangement that every few hours the students in the cars will shuffle so that everyone will get to travel a little distance in Swami's car. Right? So that shuffling was happening as they were going towards Uti. At one point, this boy got into Swami's car. <coughs> so he was sitting in the front, Swami was sitting in the back seat, pitch dark early in the morning. So he was like so grateful to be part of this trip and he was sitting there. He knows Swami is there but he can't see Swami, right? It's so dark. And in a gentle voice, he hears, maybe I should have also tried a little. <laughs> the exact thought which he had. <clears throat> Swami says, maybe I should have also tried a little. And this boy is instantly overwhelmed with the blessing that Swami has given him, he turns back, he holds Swami's legs and he says, Swami, thank you so much, Swami. And Swami pats him on his hand and Swami says, Swami says, who are the university people to give you first class? I have given you first class. He says, who are those bunch of people who have no idea of who you are to give you first class or second class, pass or fail? Swami says, I have given you first class. As we go through life, 
any number of people can think of us as being failures or success. Oh, you're a great person. You're this, you're that. You're a hopeless candidate. You're this. What, what do we have to do with that? What do we get from that? What we must strive for is this. Swami saying, I have given you my first class. I have given you first class. But having said that, one interesting thing that Swami says, to just to remind ourselves, it is not easy to get first class. Right? In one of his discourses to the students, Swami says, I don't like this modern examination system. Why? Swami says, what is that? 40% if you get to your pass. He said, how is that correct? Out of 100 questions, you answer only 40 and you pass? Swami says, it is like telling, out of 100 situations, if you do the right thing 40 times, you are a good person. Swami said, how is that fair? Swami told, in my examination, pass mark is 100%. Every time you have to be right. Every time you have to make the right choice. So my pass mark, my first class is 100%. Not 60%, not 50%. But if we make him the teacher, it becomes his responsibility. His brand name is involved. <laughs> right? If we have truly dedicated ourselves to him and say, Swami, Sishasteham, Swami, I am your student and I live by that, I can go and claim from Swami my 100%. Because you are the teacher, right? You are responsible. But two things Krishna, Arjuna says. First is he says, Sishasteham. And the second thing he says is, Tvam Prapannam, I surrender to you. Whenever Swami speaks of his students, not college students, his students, what is one thing that Swami repeatedly says? Swami says, my students are my property. That is what Arjuna said, Tvam Prapannam, Krishna, I belong to you now. I am yours. I am your student and I am yours. So if in this journey of from being a person introduced to Swami to becoming a student of Swami, if I have to be a student of Swami, I should raise my hand and say, Swami, I belong to you. Swami would often say, the moment when Hanuman goes to Lanka, Imagine the fortress that Lanka is. Nobody has ever defeated the army of Lanka. Nobody has breached the walls of Lanka. Nobody has defeated Lankini. Such a fortress Hanuman breaks into. And speaking of Hanuman, they say he is the greatest scholar. He is supposed to be a great scholar of Sanskrit. And he is supposed to be of royal lineage a great warrior, unparalleled in strength. And he has proved it by being in Ravana's court. And Ravana looks at him and asks, a hey, koti, a hey, monkey, who are you? He didn't say I am a scholar. He didn't say I am a prince. He didn't say I am the mightiest. He didn't say I am a minister of Sugriva. He says, Dasoham Kosale Indrasya. I belong to Rama. He took pride only in that one fact. I belong to my Swami. In this journey, can we stand up and say, I belong to you, Swami. In one of the Padhyams that Swami beautifully writes, he says, Ananda Balude, Ananda Baludai. He says, Ananda Balude, that son of Nanda, Krishna, has come as Ananda Baludai, as this Balasai, who is full of fun and frolic. Ananda Balude, Ananda Baludai, he says, Tanavari Gurtimpa Tarali Vache. Why has he come again? 
తన వారి గుర్తింప తరలి వచ్చి ఐ హ్యావ్ కమ్ టు రెకగ్నైజ్ దోస్ దట్ బిలాంగ్ టు మీ ఐ హ్యావ్ కమ్ టు ఆస్క్ హూ ఇస్ దేర్ హూ సేస్ స్వామి ఐ ఎమ్ యోర్స్ తన వారి గుర్తింప తరలి వచ్చి can we say that this body this life swami is yours the moment anybody buys a property what is the first thing we do we put one board property belongs to so and so trespassers will be prosecuted when we say this life swami belongs to you i think we should have the full confidence that nothing that is a casual trespasser will come into my life however painful that event may be i feel that we should imagine swami standing at the door at the gate of our life and saying i will allow only those who will bring you closer to me into your life i will allow only those experiences which will bring you closer to me to enter your life because answer is leaked swami what do you want swami asks what do you want swami we want you because you have said i want you i have now taken charge of this property and any difficulty any pain any trauma any success any fortune comes to you not as a trespasser but with my approval because this property belongs to me i will end with one story which is from one of the puranams it's called periya puranam story of devotees of lord shiva i would like to i very fondly love recollecting the story because i feel it is the story of many of our lives there is this boy who is born in a brahmin family very charming looking child so the parents name him sundarar the handsome looking one even as a boy he is very charming sundara they name him so one day when the king is driving past on the streets he sees this boy and he says oh such a charming boy he says i want to adopt this child so the king becomes like the guardian of that child so even though he is born in a normal family he is brought up like a prince and this boy is grows up to be a handsome boy he likes to dress well likes to look good finally comes to an age where he is ready for marriage so the family looks for a suitable bride and he is very happy very beautiful bride life is going very smooth everything going like a dream he is sitting in the marriage hall ready to tie the knot when an old man walks in looks like a yogi long beard unkept hair ochre robes he walks in and he says stop the marriage everybody is stunned they ask him what happened who is this man he says this marriage cannot happen because this sundarar he is my bond slave he says he is my bond slave he can do only what i permit him to do so sundarar is like who is this man i've never seen him he gets up and shouts at him there's a lot of commotion finally this old man produces a document he says his great grandfather is written and given that all my family belongs to you so this sundarar belongs to me so the elders in the village look at the document they say the document is genuine so they tell sundarar now you have to go with him so this old man snatches sundarar from one of the most beautiful lives that he was going to lead and takes him away and he says follow me and he is walking <clears throat> sundar is going on asking what is wrong with you who are you why are you spoiling my life like this i was having a good time i was going to have a good life all that the old man says is keep quiet and come shut up and come and he asks him where do you stay he points out the tallest building in the village always the temple he shows the temple gopuram and says that is my house sundar thinks maybe he is a beggar who sleeps in the temple so i am also becoming to become a beggar now 
then they walk go into the temple and as sundarar is watching this old man walks into the sanctum and merges into the lingam and he appears as lord shiva and sundarar is shocked he says what is this lord what what leela is this of yours and then lord tells him he said you may have forgotten your past you were one of the servitors in kailasha with me you did some mistake because of which you were cursed to be born a human you take a human birth before you were born you came to me and asked for a boon he says lord i know this world full of maya i know what will happen if one steps inside how one will get lost i pray to you before i get lost come and reclaim me come and reclaim me and say you are mine and shiva said i have kept my promise i have come to reclaim you <clears throat> then sundarar says what am i to do i don't know what what do you want to do what do you want me to do with this life lord shiva says sing my praises sing my praises he says i don't know any poetry i don't know any language how do i extol you how do i call you lord shiva asks him when you first met me what did you call me when you first started fighting with you fight me what did you call me now the devotee is very embarrassed because he called him a madman he says oh madman in in tamil it is pitta pittan means mad fellow so he says oh mad fellow why are you disturbing my life like this and lord shiva says see my children my devotees whatever name they call me is dear to me is pleasant to me so he says sing my verses calling me oh madman and that's how sundara writes his first verse pitta peresudi perumane arulala yattal man he says oh madman who has the moon in his locks let me think of you without forgetting you even for a moment he is a madman otherwise why will he choose you and me once when we were students swami comes up to anil kumar sir <clears throat> and out of the blue totally random swami comes to him and asks who is the most luckiest person in the world yes who is the luckiest person in the world and without a moment's thought anil kumar says swami it's me i'm the most luckiest person in the world swami asks enduku why and he says swami thousands of people are sitting here so many people are seated here but you are coming and talking to me am i not the luckiest swami was very happy but swami was not done swami asked him who is the unluckiest person in the whole world and again without a moments thought he says swami you are the most unluckiest person in the whole world and swami asks why there are thousands of people here but you are coming and talking to me he truly is out of his mind for choosing people like me to come and speak about him because if he had chosen he could have chosen anyone if we sit here as a singer as an office bearer as as a sevadal let us remember this he could have chosen anyone 100000 times better than us he was silly enough to choose you and me that makes us the luckiest in this world isn't it if even now when he comes and says you belong to me he has walked into our life like he walked into sundara's life and says you belong to me even now if we say no swami i belong to the world let me go back what unfortunate it would be on our part as i said swami chose me as the speaker for this session not because you all needed to listen to me he chose me because i needed to listen to myself and i truly believe that and 
how 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 much more grateful can you be to swami how much more can you express your gratitude to swami that he has chosen us in whatever small way the fortune of being a student of swami's college came to me i only pray that swami one day in this striving you allow me to be a student of you and become your property i offer this at bhagwan's lotus feet thank you all for your very patient listening